Hi, welcome to Calvary Lutheran for our online Bible study. This is week one of two of a series in which we are looking at a reason for hope, a glimpse of heaven, as we take a look at the book of Revelation, especially chapters 21 and 22. So today's Bible study is really meant to kind of lay the groundwork for what we're going to look at in the scriptures themselves. So while we may not spend a whole lot of time within the very texts of scripture today, is that we lay the groundwork for some of our important conversations. And so I have a number of questions for you to ponder, reflect, or if you have somebody else that you're watching this with, uh, for you to go ahead and discuss and to talk that out with others. And so as we begin, let us begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, you know all that is going on within our lives. We pray that you would now allow your word to speak into the very distinct and direct things that we are facing. So give to us hope even in the midst of our trials. Give to us peace even in the midst of our fears. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would give to us courage, that we may live each and every day boldly for you. All of this we pray in your Son's holy and precious name. Amen. And so let us now join in looking at our reflections for today. And so I'm going to put out one you know, question. We're going to start off, I don't know, maybe an easy one. <laughs> I hope you catch the sarcasm. Yeah, that this is a kind of broad picture question in respect. It's, it's a super big, super deep question, but it's one that I think really helps us focus our topic today. And so I invite you to go ahead and think and reflect upon this question. If you need to pause your uh, video right where it is, you are welcome to do so and then pick it up from there. But the question is, what is the ultimate hope of the Christian faith? Is that what is it that we are really looking forward to? So hopefully you've had the chance to think and reflect just a little bit about what is it that is our ultimate hope? That what is it that we're looking forward to? What is it that awaits us? So I think many would begin to you know, use different terms or different words that are out there. I think that there's a lot of different things that we could say. What's our ultimate hope? Is that, you know, some might simply say, you know, Jesus, you know, that that's a Sunday school or children's message answer. You know, that who is our ultimate hope? Jesus is our hope. And that others might, you know, might speak about uh, the fact of like the idea of that we are, are waiting that hope of afterlife. We are awaiting that hope of peace, that we are awaiting uh, that, that very, that ultimate hope is our salvation that Christ has worked for us. But what we really want to be thinking about, and I kind of phrase in that way, what is it that we are looking forward to? And I think that's where maybe some people, or many, many people, might begin to answer things like, we are looking forward to heaven. We are looking forward to the afterlife. We're looking forward to being with God. We're looking forward for no more death, no more sadness, no more pain, no more problems. And so we all put that under that category of often spoken of heaven. But the question is, is heaven truly our ultimate hope? I mean, if heaven is our ultimate hope, how many of you out there today are ready to go ahead and go today? Yeah. Well, <laughs> maybe there's some of us that respond immediately. I've, I've still got stuff to do. <laughs> I've got people to spend time with. I have things that are there. Is that I have stuff that I want to experience in this life. And so, so some of us, even though we might begin to answer this question, what is our ultimate hope and what is it that we're looking forward to, is that they might ultimately go to that idea of heaven, but then it's a little bit uncertain <laughs> of, is that really where we want to go today? <laughs> and so if we think a little bit deeper, what is it that we are pondering and reflecting on? It's not just simply that we are waiting for heaven. 
It's not even that we are simply awaiting for Christ to return. I mean, that's also a beautiful and wonderful thing. And it ushers in this bigger picture. But I think also it just comes down to that point of what is it that we are hoping, clamoring for, excited about of what is to come and what is it that the Bible holds out to us. And so in order to kind of maybe force us to go a little bit deeper, and it may be one that you might be surprised by this, but so we want to start thinking deeper, what is it that we're really hoping for? But we also need to look back just a little bit. And so the second question that I want you to ponder today is this one, is that why does it matter that Jesus rose from the dead? What was so meaningful? What was so intentional? What was so purposeful about Christ's resurrection from the dead? And what import does that have within this world? So I'll give you a little bit of time to reflect, to think, to discuss. What is it that Jesus' resurrection means? Now maybe some of you guys gave some, I don't know, pretty, pretty normal kind of Lutheran confirmation catechism answers on this one. We might say things along the lines that Jesus' resurrection of the dead proves that Christ's death upon the cross was a sufficient sacrifice for our sin. And now it is the evidence and proof that God has accepted that sacrifice. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> that is very, very right. But is that all that it means? Then what is it that Jesus' resurrection means? Now, I'm, sh I'm absolutely certain that it means that he truly has power over death. It truly means that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, because he has fulfilled the promise of what he had come to do. That as he said again and again before he ever got to Jerusalem, is that he would suffer, that he would die, and that he would rise from the dead. And so what else does it mean? So, I mean, it may be a matter of promise, you know, that the, the resurrection of Jesus gives to us the promise of the forgiveness that is ours because of his death. Is that maybe it's that proof that shows who he is, that identity that is there. That his rising from the dead shows his great and amazing, you know, just power over uh, over creation and all that's there. There's a lot of things that we might be able to express and explain, but I want us to go ahead and turn and look at one section of the scripture to think a little bit deeper on this. And so we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 to hear these words. That Paul says this, we start in verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you have received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word that I preached to you. So Paul is about to expound the gospel. What is the good news of Jesus? Paul's about to express what's the content of of this good news for us because Jesus died and rose again. So what does Paul say? Verse 3, For what I received I passed on to you as of first important, that importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And so once again you hear this idea of, according to the scriptures, according to the scriptures, that he died and that he rose. But what does he also add? That he was, you know, that, and then he appeared to Peter, and then to 12, 
to the 12, and then after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are, who are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. So what is the gospel according to Paul? was that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he rose from the dead according to the scriptures. And now what is it that he and so many other witnesses have the chance to do? To proclaim the good news that he has done this. But he lays out that Peter and the 12 and 500 of the brothers in, in the faith and talking about James and himself, Paul speaks about the gospel in that general sense that is there of this whole encompassing salvation from God for all. But he gives witnesses, witnesses who many are still living. That if the uh, Corinthians wanted to seek out them and seek out that very evidence, they have every ability to. That Paul is laying out the certainty of what he proclaims. And he places an emphasis on just how many people proclaim this resurrection of Jesus. So why does it all matter? See, Paul starts first off talking salvation in general. Then he speaks of salvation in specific as he talks about the grace that has been his, that he now is who he is because of the grace of Jesus. But now here's the import. He says in verse 12, But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, then how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. And then Paul just goes around and around in argumentative circles to press home that very point. That if Christ is not raised, well then why do we preach? Then why does anyone believe? <laughs> that if Christ is not raised, then why do we even have hope? But what does Paul go on to proclaim in verse 20? He says this, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Did you catch that? That Christ has indeed been raised, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Because when we confess in the Apostles' Creed that I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. When we confess the resurrection of the body, is that what do we confess? Are we confessing that Jesus really did rise from the dead? Do we confess that that body that died on the cross now is alive and risen? Sometimes I think that many of us, that's what kind of fills our mind. But Paul, i sorry, not Paul, but the Apostles' Creed has already confessed that in the second article as it says that I believe that Jesus Christ was crucified, died, and was buried, and the third day he rose again from the dead, and you know, he ascended into heaven. And so what do we see? We've already confessed that Christ was risen from the dead, previously in that second article of the Apostles' Creed. But here we confess that I believe in the resurrection of the body. We're not talking about the body of Jesus, even though certainly he was resurrected from the dead. We're talking about our body. We're talking about the bodies of all who have died 
which shall be resurrected, shall be raised up, and those who have faith, that they shall rise to that very eternity that is not just heaven, but the very gifts that are now ours. See, this leads us, Paul starts talking about the first fruits, that Jesus is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. What are the first fruits? That those in the Old Testament, that that was the very first 10% of their very crops and fields, the very first things that were brought in from that harvest were given to God. They were a sign and a symbol of all that was yet to come. Out of thanksgiving and out of trust, now the very people would present their offering to God in trust that he shall provide. But what does it mean that now God has given us the first fruits? That he has given us Jesus, who is the first fruits of all that is yet to come that it is that promise of the certainty, the assurance that all who die in Christ shall be raised again from the dead. That it's that promise of what is yet to come. And so when we begin to ask that question of not just what's our ultimate hope, of what are we looking forward to, but that question of what does the resurrection of Jesus mean for that ultimate hope of where life is going? then how do we begin then to answer some of those questions? Because what do you expect? Yes, that's, you know, it might help if I you know, click the button in. So what do you expect eternity to look like? I want you to think about that. So what does eternity look like in the midst of your thought process? Think and reflect about what all that might be. Who's there? How do we interact? What is it that God has promised? What is it that is now ours to enjoy? And compare that to our next question. Then what misconceptions of heaven and the afterlife are common with the popular culture and media of which we are a part? I think many times when we think about the common conceptions of heaven, we think of nice white billowy clouds we think of, of people moving about with their wings because all of us will have wings, right? Well, at least, at least we'll have Red Bull and we'll have wings and it'll all be good. Don't worry. <laughs> now, what is it that we see? So often, heaven is kind of this wispy, airy, light place that is there. Maybe we might have visions of golden gates <laughs> or gates that are there uh, standing before us of who's going to be let in and who's not is that maybe we have perceptions in the media and in our uh, culture and those different uh, places of that uh, kind of thin wispiness. But is that what we expect? Is that what we look toward? That when we think about heaven, heaven is much more real than I think even we sometimes are willing to admit. That it has real substance, real place. It has a reality of why is it that we say, well, I want to go to heaven, that's my hope, but I don't want to leave here. It's because God has given us that gift of the blessing of joining his creation. That when we think about all that is there, and we think about the reflection of what is ahead, that our hope is not just someday to get to heaven, but our hope is that that very day shall come when Christ shall return and that he shall make a new heavens and a new earth, that he shall once again join that which was separated, and that we may be raised from the dead and now live not just as either thin, wispy ghosts that you could just pass a hand through, or as simply those angelic beings floating about. But know that we might be truly embodied as the way that we should have been. The way that we once were in perfection all the way back at the beginning of creation. 
then what is it that we begin to reflect upon? See, when we talk about these things, so often when we discuss these topics of heaven and, and all of the things that are a part of that, is that so often it's when somebody close to us has died. And so naturally, because that's when we most think about it and that's when we most, most preach about it, that we naturally often think that it's simply that's the focus, that when we reach heaven, that's where it is. But I want you to go ahead and reflect just a little bit. There's that there's a hymn that's uh, that's sung, you know, that's uh, that has this whole idea, you know, of earth is but a desert drear, but heaven is our home. And so, you know, that is it true that earth is just kind of a desert, a dreary place, a kind of you know dry and dusty and just oh, <laughs> but heaven is our home. How would you answer that? Is earth just a desert drear, but heaven is our home? Why or why not? I invite you to reflect on that. And so it is that understanding that when we think about this world, certainly we will understand the trials and the persecutions and the problems and the issues. We understand the the predicaments that we experience, the frustrations, the exhaustion, the worry that comes in, especially when trials come. But is earth only that? Certainly compared to heaven, <laughs> is that it's, it's not even comparable in its glory and its honor and its beauty. But earth is gifted with its very blessings that God has showered upon it. And God has blessed us still with his presence and his work. And so many times we get the chance of glimpses within this life to see all that he has indeed blessed this creation with. And so can we simply look at it in that kind of way? Now, I think that we're called to something deeper something bigger, that we have a reason to hope that Jesus truly rose from the dead. And so therefore, because he is risen, that we have a reason for hope in the very things that are to come, and we get a glimpse of heaven. And so how does Revelation start us off? As we close out our, our initial kind of prep work and our initial reflection, hear now those words from Revelation chapter 21, verse 1 and following. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a beautiful bride dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with mankind, and he will live with them. Is that they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And so what do we see? We see this beautiful heavenly Jerusalem coming down out of heaven to join with the earth, that God is coming down to dwell with us. See, when we begin to think about what is our hope, our hope is in that very promise, that we shall return to the way that things once were, in beauty, in perfection, in God's own presence shall we dwell and live and have our being, that heaven shall meet earth, that we shall be changed, and we shall inhabit that very blessing that God has now given. And so that is a reason to hope, a glimpse of what is to come, that God is faithful to his promises. And so may God bless you as you continue to look deeper into Revelation 21 and 22 as we prepare for our next session together, as we join together in his word. 
May God's blessings go with you this day. Amen.